This is a revision video for AQA GCSE Chemistry or Combined Science, looking at the fifth topic, which is the energy changes topic. 40% of the marks in GCSE Science are for recall of facts that are listed in your specification. So this video is an opportunity to make sure that you know all those facts. You can download the questions from the description below and then work through these with the video checking your answers. Let's get started. Just like in GCSE Physics, the law of conservation of energy tells us that energy cannot be created or destroyed. The amount of energy in the universe must be the same at the start and the end of a chemical reaction, although that energy can be transferred from one store to another. If the temperature of the surroundings change during a chemical reaction, then this difference in energy must be accounted for by the difference in energy between the chemical store of the reactants and the chemical store of the products. An exothermic reaction is one that transfers energy from the chemical bonds of the reactants to the surroundings, and this will usually cause the surroundings to warm up. Examples of exothermic reactions include combustion, oxidation and neutralisation. And in our everyday lives, exothermic reactions can be used to make hand warmers and self-heating cans. An endothermic reaction is the opposite of an exothermic reaction in that it absorbs energy from the surroundings, usually causing them to cool down. Although, of course, photosynthesis is an example of an endothermic reaction that doesn't produce a substantial temperature change. Endothermic reactions include the thermal decomposition of metal carbonates and the reaction of citric acid and sodium hydrogen carbonate. Endothermic reactions can be used in some examples of those sports cool packs that you might use instead of an ice pack. To determine whether a reaction was exothermic or endothermic, you would of course use a thermometer. These next questions are all about the required practical, and I should say that there are many different reactions you can do for this required practical. So for instance, you can add different samples of metals to acids or to copper sulphate. Um, you could add the same metal every time and change the mass. So for the purposes of these questions, I've assumed, as it says in the title, that we're adding different metals to some acid. When you're doing this required practical, the reaction vessel you would choose would be a polystyrene container, because this is going to prevent the loss of energy to the surroundings. In this example, the independent variable would be the different metals being added. Remember, your independent variable is the thing that you are changing throughout the experiment. The dependent variable is the thing that we measure, so here it would be the temperature change. If we're changing the identity of the metal, so adding different metals each time, everything else needs to be the same and controlled. So we would need to add the same mass of metal, we would need to use the same volume of acid and also the concentration of the acid, and also the identity of the acid. So if it's hydrochloric acid for the first experiment, it should be hydrochloric acid for all of them. Collision theory is the idea that in order for a chemical reaction to happen, the particles involved need to collide and they need to have a minimum amount of energy, which we call the activation energy. So therefore, activation energy can be defined as the minimum amount of energy required for a chemical reaction to proceed. An energy profile for an exothermic reaction would look like this. So as you can see, it's important that we have horizontal lines on the left and right to represent the reactants and the products. We have a hump in the middle, and because this is an exothermic reaction, the reactants on the left need to be higher than the products on the right. The activation energy is always labelled from the height of the reactants up to the top of the hump, what we call the transition stage. So you should have an arrow there. The overall energy change goes from the reactants to the products. So for an exothermic reaction, it goes down. If a catalyst were used, this will provide an alternative pathway with a lower activation energy. So the hump of the diagram should be less high. For an endothermic reaction, we would draw a similar diagram, but the heights of the reactants and products are reversed. So we're going to start low and finish high. The next four questions are only for pupils taking higher tier. So if you're going to sit the foundation paper, you don't need to answer questions 20 to 23. Bond breaking absorbs energy, whereas making bonds releases energy. Be careful here, make sure that you're not saying that it's producing energy. The energy isn't new, it's just being released from the bonds into the surroundings. To calculate the overall energy change for a reaction, you need to add up the energy required to break all the bonds on the left hand side, and add up the energy required to make all the bonds on the right hand side of the chemical equation, 
and then do the bonds broken take away the bonds made. For this final question, we want to say that if a reaction is exothermic, more energy is released in making the bonds than is taken in to break the bonds. If the reaction is endothermic, then more energy is absorbed breaking the bonds than is released making the bonds. The remaining questions in this video are all from the GCSE chemistry specification, so if you're taking the GCSE combined science exams, you don't need to watch the rest of the video. Chemical cells contain chemicals which undergo chemical reactions to produce electricity. Two factors that will affect the voltage produced by a cell are the different metals that have been used to make the electrodes and the electrolyte that they're submerged in. A simple cell can be made from two different metals that are wired together and are in contact with an electrolyte. A battery is the name we give to multiple cells that have been wired together in series, and the reason we do this is to produce a greater voltage, which we can also call potential difference. Rechargeable cells stop working when one of the chemicals in the cell runs out. Alkaline batteries are an example of a rechargeable cell. Rechargeable cells can be recharged by connecting a current which is flowing in the opposite direction to the current produced when the cell was running. Two advantages of using rechargeable cells are that it prevents the need for disposing of the toxic metals that are in the cell anyway, and it also prevents the need for extracting more of those same metals which are often very rare. The greater the difference in reactivity between the two electrodes in a chemical cell, the greater the voltage of the cell will be. Fuel cells produce a potential difference from the electrochemical oxidation of a fuel such as hydrogen or methanol. The overall chemical equation that happens in a hydrogen fuel cell is two hydrogen molecules reacting with one oxygen molecule to produce two water molecules. Using hydrogen fuel cells rather than hydrogen as a combustion fuel is much more efficient because there isn't any heat loss. Hydrogen fuel cells have an advantage over using fossil fuels as a combustion fuel because there isn't any direct release of carbon dioxide, because the only waste product is water. One advantage of hydrogen fuel cells over rechargeable batteries is that they run continuously rather than as a batch process, so there's no reduction in efficiency. However, a disadvantage is that hydrogen is extremely flammable and explosive and therefore very difficult to store. Using hydrogen fuel cells may still have negative environmental consequences despite their waste product being water because that hydrogen has to come from somewhere and it either comes from the electrolysis of water, which is very energy intensive, or from reacting methane with steam, which releases carbon dioxide as a waste product. The half equation that occurs at the anode in a hydrogen fuel cell is two hydrogen molecules splitting apart to make four hydrogen ions and four electrons, and at the cathode we see an oxygen molecule reacting with two water molecules and taking on those four electrons to produce four hydroxide ions. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you're now feeling confident in recalling these key facts from the Unit 5 specification. If you did find the video useful then don't forget to like and subscribe below for more GCSE chemistry content coming soon.